Hi everyone, I am Laura Young, Vice President of Philanthropy. And hi, I'm Sherry Gallion. I'm the Director of Strategic Learning here at the Maine Community Foundation. And we want to welcome you for joining us on this webinar today. The purpose is to provide an update on the Maine Community Foundation's work on the grant making side since COVID-19 hit here in March. We have invited all of our donors who contributed to our COVID-19 fund, everyone who has a donor advised fund at the Maine Community Foundation, our current and former board members, our other volunteers who are on our county committees and all of our other grant making committees. As far as an outline, I will start with an overview of our strategies for addressing the needs due to the pandemic. Sherry will give an overview of all COVID related grants and focus in particular on our COVID-19 fund for emergency relief, which we will just call the COVID-19 fund and our strategies for grant making through this fund and what we're hearing from nonprofit organizations. I will share some details on our grant making from our donor advised funds and some recommendations for next steps for funding through the fall and the winter. We received some great questions from many of you at registration. So after we go through that overview, we will have a Q&A session and we'll start with the questions that we've received and if we have time, we would love to take questions from you. And you see on your screen, you have a chat function. Feel free to use the chat function to say hi to everyone. I'm Laura from Durham. Um, and you can use the Q&A function to ask questions. So we'll be busy with this technology while we're giving the presentation. But we, when we get to the Q&A time, we'll go specifically to that area to get your questions. And so let me, oh, and also those of you who have used Zoom, you know this, but when we have the PowerPoint up, there will be a box with the presenters. Feel free to move the box around if you need to, or even get rid of us if you wanna see everything that's on the page. So overview of our strategies. In March, immediately after the state's shutdown, the Maine Community Foundation set up the COVID-19 fund. Our board voted to seed the fund with $500,000, which came from money that we received a few years ago, thanks to a generous unrestricted bequest. The rest of the funding came mostly in March and April and came from about a million dollars from our donors who have donor advised funds at the Community Foundation transferring from their fund to the COVID-19 fund. And we also received an additional $1.3 million from pri private foundations and also the general public. <clears throat> and many of you are on this webinar and we truly thank you for your contributions, your ongoing contributions to this fund. In a little bit, Sherry will review where this funding went and how it helped. At this time, we also tapped into other funds here at the Community Foundation, including a fund for food security, animal welfare, hospice support to make additional grants. We encouraged our donor advisors to contribute directly and you responded, you know, there were 6 million grants, but when we were look, from the donor advised fund donors, but when we looked at those grants just to see which looked like they were triggered particularly to address COVID, uh, we would say it's about $3.4 million in COVID-related grants from March through early June, July, sorry. And actually we stopped tracking in early July because it became more difficult to figure out what was triggered by COVID and what was a, a traditional grant moving forward. We made changes to our competitive grant making programs. For instance, the priority was to expedite getting dollars out the door, mostly through our community building grant program. That deadline is February 15th. So by early March, the nonprofits had already applied 
for specific projects. So when we were quickly reviewing those with our volunteer advisors, we allowed the grantees to use funding for either the project as proposed or for general operating support because we knew that was definitely needed at the time. And we've continued to make additional changes and, and we'll do so moving forward in our grant making programs. And also a tremendous flexibility to the nonprofits, knowing that they're very busy extending reporting deadlines for past grants. So I would like to thank the Maine Philanthropy Center and they have been a great partner. I'm multitasking, pulling up a, the PowerPoint while I talk. They have been a great partner of the Community Foundation as they are tracking the grant, the foundation giving, and that has been a good resource for us to see where other foundations are giving throughout the state. Take it away, Sherry. Thank you, Laura. Um, so um, as Laura said, if you can, if you have any questions, um, as I'm talking, I'm gonna go through our grant making um, in a bit more detail. I'm gonna go through our strategies. If questions come up while I'm talking, um, please use that Q&A um, area. It's right down, if you um, scroll down to the bottom of the Zoom screen, you'll see a little Q&A box. If you click on that and type in your question, um, we'll make sure we get to it. Um, if you can avoid putting questions in the chat, it's harder for us to track the questions in the chat and pull them out, and I don't wanna miss anything. Um, so please feel free to use that Q&A box and we will get to it. Um, at, the, at the end of each section. Um, so first, as Laura said, we did pull from, we saw grant making come from um, a variety of funds um, during, um, during the COVID period. And um, this chart that I put together really shows you what Laura was talking about. Um, in the uh, sort of medium blue, that is the COVID-19 emergency fund grant making. So that is um, discretionary grant making that a staff team did um, out of the gifts that we were given. So thank you so much, made a huge impact. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but I also just wanted to give you the complete picture of what this looks like. So that's the COVID-19 emergency fund piece. The light blue piece is um, the discretionary funds, the very restricted funds that Laura was talking about. Um, it's mostly comprised of food funds for food security, that will be included in the COVID-19 grant making that I'll talk about, but also funds that were restricted to animal welfare organizations and hospice organizations, both of whom experienced some um, increased um, costs and challenges early on in COVID as they were trying to adapt their model um, to working in the new reality. So that's what that is. So that was about 7% of our grant making. And then that huge portion, 51%, those were all our donor advised funds doing what we believe was grant making above and beyond what they would normally do um, in response to COVID. And near the end, Laura will talk more about what that kind of grant making looked like. But so this gives you the, the full picture of, um, of what our grant making looked like. All, overall, it was over $6 million um, that, that we sent out the door to help support a nonprofit. Um, so before I dig deeper into um, the specifics of the grant making, what we actually funded, I wanted to make sure that I went over the sort of background of what we were thinking as we handled the COVID-19 emergency fund um, and to help you understand the decisions that the staff team made on how we were going to distribute funds. Um, so first, we decided early on that because we had advertised and, and created this fund as, as a direct response fund, it was very important that all of the funding that came out of this support direct assistance organizations, uh, meaning organizations that were most directly helping manners through this crisis. Um, it, it usually that meant organizations providing direct relief to individuals um, in a way that felt measurable and, and really immediate. Um, it was very important that we provide flexibility in the funding. Um, and I mean that in two different ways. First, I mean that the funds we were actually sending to nonprofits were flexible in their use. Um, things were moving very quickly um, this spring and nonprofits were moving very quickly and responding um, before they even had funding to do so. Um, so it was really important to us that we not send out funds that were restricted and hamper, hampered nonprofits from being um, 
from reacting to the needs that they were seeing. So the funding that went out was unrestricted. Um, so that meant that uh, we would send it to an organization and they could use it either for uh, funding direct services like food, or they could use it for paying staff to help uh, manners through things. So it could go to overhead. It was unrestricted and flexible in its use. Um, and I'll get more into how, what we saw at the end, uh, what we learned about that. Um, and secondly, I mean flexible in that we could redirect the funding as time went on and needs became more apparent. Uh, for example, as COVID spread in Maine, um, I think all of us know that there became, it became clear that there was definite um, crisis within our immigrant and refugee communities, and they were being the hardest hit by the spread of COVID. Uh, so as that happened, we were able to redirect funding more to those communities to help them address the needs that they were seeing arise, um, mostly through sort of the late spring and early summer. Um, it was important to us that we were protecting the populations that were most at risk, both, both most at risk of COVID-19 itself um, and also from the economic fallout. Uh, we definitely wanted to be directing the funds to those who were suffering and feeling the pinch the most. Um, the, the percentages that you see on the slide here are show the percentages of the grant making that went out to target populations. Now, some of these populations overlap, of course, but um, when we send out a grant, what we are saying is what population are we hoping will benefit from this grant? Um, so 44% of the grants went out to low income to benefit low income manners. 17% to the immigrant and refugee population. Again, as I said, as some of those funds were directed as we saw the, the impact of COVID on that uh, group. 11% um, went to at-risk youth, um, teens and children and families in need of more support. 8% went to older people who were um, isolated by this pandemic and um, really struggling to connect and get services they might need. And then another 20% was focused on um, smaller groups, small, smaller specific groups such as um, homeless, uh, essential workers, childcare for essential workers, um, tribal populations, and women. Um, finally, we wanted to make sure we were um, doing our grant making in a way that was balanced, um, in that we wanted to address the statewide needs on a broad, uh, on, in a broad way. Um, by funding larger organizations that had really big reach, but we also knew it was important to support community level organizations that were doing the more immediate localized needs. So for example, um, we did give one of our largest grants, $75,000 to Good Shepherd Food Bank uh, because they have such a broad reach across the state and because they're such an important important link in the chain of distribution for food. Um, they're able to access large quantities of food and then distribute it across the state. So we wanted to support them in that. Um, however, we also gave out smaller grants to um, food pantries across the state, smaller food pantries, um, because we know that they were taking the food from Good Shepherd, adding to it with local produce and locally appropriate or culturally appropriate foods, and then doing the work to get it actually out to people um, through curbside pickup and other new distribution models. Um, so that just sort of shows the balance that we were looking for. Um, we were also very careful to make sure we were balancing our uh, grant making geographically across the state. While we did occasionally have, um, have grants that uh, were for specific areas or specific regions that were higher hit, when we were funding broad, things like food pantries or homeless shelters, we made sure we were hitting all of the regions of Maine so that we could benefit all uh, individuals. Um, just so you know, as we go through the slides, um, I have included photos of some of our COVID-19 grantees um, so that you can see the work that was being done with the funding. Um, this photo is from Presente Maine. Uh, which did a significant amount of food distribution, particularly in the greater Portland area. So here they are sorting out some foods outside with masks, um, nice and safe, getting ready to distribute food across greater Portland area. So, um, so this is where the funding actually went. Um, we, we granted out, when you include the discretionary funds for food security and the COVID-19 emergency fund, we totaled $3.1 million um, that's gone out through the door. We just had another round of grants go out last week, so we're still, you know, sending funding out as is appropriate. 
Um, if you want more detailed information about any of these grants and you want to see the specific grants, those are all on our website. So you can go to our website and click our COVID-19 emergency fund and you can see a full listing of all the grants. But in general, um, the vast majority of our funding, 35%, went to what we term general social service. Um, it's a very broad category. Um, but what we found is that um, a, a, there was a huge need um, in, the, in, in sort of just generally helping Mainers connect to the services they need. Um, if you're familiar with our community action partnerships or programs um, such as Opportunity Alliance or Community Concepts or the Aroostook County Action Program, um, those are the types of organizations that we're receiving this bulk, the, this 35% of our funding. Um, and it's because not only were they providing direct services to people like gas cards and food, and, and that, but they were providing more case management help. Um, you know, there were a lot of Mainers who needed to apply for unemployment, sometimes for the very first time. Um, and as you know, the unemployment system was a real struggle. So um, they're providing help with people applying for unemployment. They're providing help for people applying to state, for state rental relief. Um, applying for TANF, you know, just helping people connect to resources. There was a huge need for that and they were definitely assisting. Um, so, um, so that was the, the general social services and, and we really found them to be incredibly um, helpful to Mainers during this time. Um, the second largest category of funding was food. Um, by far, whenever we asked our nonprofits what they were seeing a need for, uh, food is what came up, food support. Um, and by food, I don't just mean food pantries, although that was certainly a big piece of it, but also meal delivery services, such as Meals on Wheels, um, we, which was providing a key outreach to a number of very isolated seniors um, in the state of Maine. So Meals on Wheels or uh, the food, local food pantries, um, Southern Maine Agency on Area, Southern Maine Agency on Aging is uh, an example. Uh, we funded them to support their home delivered meals program. So that was a critical piece was the food. Um, and we continue to hear that that is a, is a huge struggle for folks. The third category um, is health and safety. Um, this is a, again, a somewhat broad category that includes things such as direct health services, um, such as supporting telehealth um, programs, uh, supporting uh, the purchase of PPE, personal protective equipment for people working directly with clients, um, and also supporting mental health supports, uh, domestic violence sheltering and supports, um, and recovery supports. Uh, for example, we gave a funding to uh, the Bangor Area Recovery Network to help them continue the recovery services and supports that they were providing online so that their clients and people in recovery could feel less isolated um, and would have a place to share um, their struggles and still feel connected to their supportive recovery community. Um, Fourth, uh, fourth place, we, have a, we had a few different areas of funding that sort of tied <laughs> for fourth place, but they were all critical. Um, the first one was childcare. Um, and this was an early funding area um, specifically to support childcare for essential workers, um, our healthcare workers, our retail workers, um, people who still needed to be on the job every day even though many of their childcare options were shutting down. Um, what we found was that a number of, in particular, WISE and Boys and Girls Clubs were able to stay open with enhanced COVID precautions in order to provide that critical childcare for our essential workers. But it came at a huge cost to their organizations um, because they were able to take in fewer kids, but they saw increased costs. Um, they really needed a little extra grant funding to help float them through that period. So we helped provide that support. Um, we also provided what we were calling technology support, which helped support uh, both students uh, in remote learning in the spring, but also our agencies on aging, helping them provide devices to their clients to help keep them connected with the services they needed um, and to help check in on them regularly. We also gave a grant to adult education to help provide devices, loaner devices for their students so they could continue to access the um, high school completion, career training, and college transitions programming that they depended on. 
And finally, the, the other category sort of in the 6% range was housing. That's mostly um, for homeless shelters, which um, didn't necessarily see a huge rise in clients at the time we were making these grants, but we're seeing increased costs as they looked to um, space out their clients. They sometimes they had to put people up in hotels or rent additional space and purchase additional beds and equipment. Um, so those costs, uh, and, and that did help keep people safe during this sort of early transition period. And finally, um, the, the last category on here is support for youth. That's the support for at-risk youth um, to help them stay connected to the support systems that they might need outside of their immediate families. For example, we gave a grant to OutMaine, which provides support for LGBTQ children um, and teens, and it helped them move some of their programming online uh, so that they could continue to stay connected to this vulnerable um, group of youth. Um, through this tough time, especially bridging over the summer when um, kids weren't able to access regular school supports. So that's the category uh, breakdown of where the COVID-19 emergency um, funding went. Again, if you want to see the full grants, please feel free to go to our website and you can see that there. We changed our reporting a little bit for our COVID-19 grantees because we wanted to be respectful of um, how busy they were um, and, and we didn't want to add to the demands on their time. So um, we created a survey this summer and surveyed our grant recipients, our COVID-19 grant recipients on both what they did with their funding, but we also wanted to see if we were on the right track and we wanted to see what they were seeing out um, and hearing from their clients. So I want to share a little bit about what we learned about where the nonprofit community is and where Mainers are right now um, looking ahead. So, so I'm just going to walk through the four themes that we saw um, come up in this work and in these, uh, these grant reports uh, from the survey. Um, but I also want to read you some quotes from these, uh, these reports because frankly, they tell the story much better than we could. So the first, the very first um, theme that we noticed, and none of these will probably be a surprise, uh, the very first one is nonprofit instability. Uh, the nonprofit world is in the whole, the whole world, <laughs> for profit and nonprofit is in upheaval. But in particular, in the nonprofit world, we're seeing that their revenue is down significantly. Um, many were not able to hold fundraisers that they normally would to help boost their annual funds. Um, organizations that rely on what we call earned revenue that charge fees for programs they offer. Um, think about your theaters and your arts organizations. Th those uh, avenues have basically been cut off. Um, so they aren't getting that kind of earned revenue. And agencies that rely on state contracts for serving clients are have been able to serve fewer clients, which means they can't charge the state for reimbursement fees. Um, so they're not seeing the, the funding that they would usually depend on from the state for their services. Uh, many organizations have lost their volunteer base, and in some cases their staff. So they're trying to do more work with fewer people, or they're now needing to pay staff for work that used to be done by volunteers. Um, and many direct needs organizations have seen their programming needs really skyrocket. There's the demand is, is going up, up, up um, on many of these service agencies. So some of the quotes that we saw from people, um, because of COVID-19, providing services continues to be more expensive just across the board for organizations, um, not just because of um, increased need, but also just things like needing to provide regular cleaning supplies and PPE to staff. Managing all of the work increased because of the pandemic and managing the expectations of others as we attempt to shift and support and flex and maintain quality supports for clients and staff has been exhausting. Nonprofits are really tired and, and not sure how they're going to move forward. We're going to have to make some tough choices about what we prioritize and work on because we can't do it all, even though it is all so important. Um, I think that one is, is pretty clear on its own. Uh, this picture is from Preble Street, which really upped its food outreach um, during the spring and summer. Um, so here they are preparing a number of meals for um, not just their uh, homeless shelter clients, but 
for uh, the greater Portland area in general. The next need we saw, or the next theme that we saw uh, in these reports is snowballing needs uh, for individual, for Mainers. Um, that many organizations are seeing clients defer payments on things like uh, their rent or their electricity. Um, uh, seasonal workers were not able to work enough this summer to save to get them through the winter season, both at tourist uh, season locales, but also farm workers. Anything that really depended on sort of a short-term season was impacted. The general belief among the nonprofits that reported back to us is that this winter is going to be extremely difficult and that all of these deferred needs just keep snowballing into a larger and larger problem that um, low-income Mainers and frankly all Mainers are going to be need to be addressing this winter. Um, so some of the quotes that show this just so clearly, we anticipate that a significant number of people will continue to face financial challenges due to lost wages from COVID-19 for an extensive period of time. For some, their former livable wages have been drastically reduced, forcing them to drain their savings accounts and rely on credit cards for basic expenses. And I think what's interesting about this quote, I cut out a piece of it to make it a little shorter, but that, that they pointed out that this is not just low income Mainers, this is middle income Mainers. These are people who have um, previously been able to get by just fine um, and they may not be getting by just fine this winter. Uh, the first rumblings of this tsunami are the number of people who will be impacted by the lifting of the eviction moratorium. The second factor already impacting many in the community is the fact that essential service bills like electricity are racking up and many of them will come due at the same time. So, and that, that will be this late fall and winter unless we start seeing some greater um, state and federal support coming through. Uh, this picture is from Wabanaki Public Health, uh, which put together these wonderful little um, kits that they distributed um, ar around uh, to their to their community, um, to, especially to seniors, to help uh, them feel less isolated, to help them feel more connected, and to provide some basic needed supplies. The third theme that we saw was a real inability to plan. Um, and this is seen at both the individual level and also at the organizational level. Um, the federal and state responses to this pandemic have been very hard to predict. Um, they're not providing a real sense of continuity or a sense of um, how long this will go on. Um, unemployment and eviction moratoriums have been piecemeal and time limited um, so that, you know, it, there's, there's always this date hovering over your head of when it's going to end. Um, nonprofits can't plan because they don't know what programs will be needed, uh, what they'll be asked to do. Um, you know, I know some were surprised at what the state deferred to nonprofits that they didn't know was coming, that the state might have um, sent some emergency measures down to the nonprofit level, which they didn't know they would be asked to do. Um, so the sense that, that no one really can figure out what they're supposed to be doing next month, let alone next year, really is permeating everything. Um, it's a constant fear that we will not be able to meet the increased need and that we will have to start turning community members away. Um, dealing with the unknown as a nonprofit and trying to figure out how to dovetail our current grant funding into COVID-19 response has been very challenging. Uh, trying to figure out, we've got all these different funding streams coming in. Some are very restricted and we can't use them. Some are unrestricted. So trying to figure out how to, to manage all of this is, has been really challenging. And this next one, I think, is just captures the nonprofit experience so much right now, which is we have a long term revenue shortfall predicted with a short term major revenue increase. It is so hard to plan right now. Um, so they are seeing an increased demand and grants like ours have been helpful in helping them meet that demand. So that's their short term revenue increase. But they don't know um, if that will continue on into 2021. And so they don't know, should they keep these extra staff on? Should they let people go or furlough them? It's, it's a real conundrum trying to plan right now. Uh, as a happy picture, this picture is uh, the result of our grant to adult education. This is Director of Adult Education, Gail Sinise, delivering one of the devices that our grant purchased um, to one of her adult education directors. So, um, so I tried to put something cheerful <laughs> in that photo. 
Finally, the last theme that we saw is that families need support. Um, as school has gotten underway in most districts, this has settled a little bit more, but uh, the childcare needs are still immense and remote, remote learning support is still needed. Um, nationwide, we are seeing studies that show that women are dropping out of the workforce in huge numbers because um, the supports are not there to help them with their children for with the remote learning or uh, their child care is not um, is not available to them. We don't know what that means for Maine right now. I haven't seen any Maine specific numbers on women in the workforce, but I don't see any reason to assume that's not happening here. Um, so there's a, a concern that our families are feeling very unstable. Um, kids uh, need coverage. Kids thrive on predictable, um, static relationships and supports, and they don't have that right now. There's a concern that kids who might already have been on, on the unfortunate side of our achievement gap in um, our educational work are falling further behind um, due to remote learning and, and lack of supports. Um, so some of our quotes, where can vulnerable people turn? Now that federal unemployment payments are suspended, at the same time, Maine is planning 10% cuts, which will impact the very programs they would otherwise turn to. Where are families supposed to turn? Um, I think is an open question. The old building we operate from and the new health and safety guidelines issued to deal with COVID-19 made it impossible to serve the same number of children we were serving in March. Those are the cuts to childcare. That's how they happen that um, there's just fewer slots to go around because of COVID-19 precautions. Um, and we are working to support a population, 50% of whom do not have a home computer, 50% or more who do not have home internet, and 70% of whom say they need support homeschooling their children. This is the reality in a lot of districts is that families are being asked to provide um, technology and supports that they don't have and that they can't provide. So when those children are not physically in school, what is happening? Um, and I think that's a, is still a big unknown um, that is, is dogging everyone this school year. So just as a final thought, um, I wanted to share uh, this picture from Waterville. Oh, sorry, I forgot to, but this picture is from the Bangor Regional YMCA. I see. Uh, so uh, yeah, sorry, this is one of our child care grantees. They were one of the first to be providing child care for essential workers. Um, and so this was an, an early shot from the spring. You'll see there's no masks. I think the mask gu guidance hadn't gone in yet. Um, so the final thought to share is that when we, we gave the, I gave that overview of what our priorities and sort of assumptions are going into this. Um, and I think this quote sort of captures what we are hoping to do. MCF funds have been critical in meeting needs that fall outside of our typical funding streams with their rigid requirements. As for the impact on our staff, there is nothing worse than seeing a family or person in need and not having the resources to help. The MCF money has helped our staff's mental health and we are able to assist others and not carry the burden of having to say no because families or people don't meet arbitrary requirements. And I think that was part of our goal that was reflected in the flexible funding piece that I talked about, that um, we wanted uh, nonprofits to be able to act as they needed to without worrying that they were running into the, the tangled web of restricted, fund rate, of restricted funding. Um, so uh, the, this photo is from Waterville Creates, which like many arts organizations had to take their work completely online. Um, so here they are um, show, demonstrating how to do a still life from items you might find around in your kitchen. Um, so Laura is going to continue on talking about donor advised funds. Um, I am answering, I see one question that I'm going to check in on before Laura, before you begin. Um, are you helping any of the nonprofits with organizational function, leadership and operations? Um, do you give to dysfunctional organizations because they serve a need? We, um, we have not given any COVID-19 funding to leadership or, or specific leadership or operations improvement at this juncture because we were more focused on taking those funds in for the direct need. Um, I will say that we, were, we did do um, good research into the grantees that we funded, the same level of research we would do into all of our grantees to make sure that we were serving um, solid organizations that were funding solid organizations um, that had a good track record and that 
were doing um, the work that we needed done at that point for direct response. Laura, your turn. So Sherry was going over the grant making from our COVID-19 fund. And so this pie chart shows you the grant making from our donor advised fund grants that were triggered as a result of the pandemic between March and July. So almost 3.4 million, 80% of these grants going to nonprofits in Maine. And you'll see similar categories to our grant making through the COVID-19 fund. The largest percentage going to food at 23%. And Good Shepherd was a little over 200,000 of that. And Sherry mentioned that from our COVID-19 fund, we gave one of our largest gifts of uh, 75,000 from the COVID-19 fund. So knowing that our donors were giving directly to Good Shepherd as well, gave us the flexibility to be able to make additional grants through our COVID-19 fund to help the food pantries all around the state. The next category, that orange category, operating support. Um, let me explain that. That is for nonprofit organizations that are outside of the category that we would call direct service to people suffering because of the pandemic. So for instance, you who have a donor advised fund may have given to a local community theater knowing that they're not open. And so that's your operating support to that organization to support what they're doing. So a lot of really helpful grants because you know this is a challenging time for everybody. So it's great that our donor advisors are thinking about those nonprofits as well. The other, Sherry had already mentioned general social services grants. So those were uh, tremendous from our donor advised funds. The regranting, that's the grants that our donor advisors gave to other regranting organizations. So, for instance, the United Ways all around the state, they were, um, our donors were giving to their funds to regrant re to others. And I also just want to point out the support for individuals. And that's for funds that are giving money directly to individuals, whether it's farmers or healthcare workers or restaurant workers or um, artists. That's what, that's what that kind of funding is. So next, this is our overview and we've been getting questions from people whether they have funds with us or not about being strategic because this is a new world for all of us. So we put together these strategies, whether you're giving directly or giving through the community foundation, First of all, continue to give to your favorite nonprofit organization. They truly need the money. And if you can give them a sense of what you're planning to give this year, what you're planning to give next year, it's so helpful as they're doing planning projections for their operations. So uh, because the money is so up and down. Number two, as Sherry stated, these unrestricted contributions are so valuable because so many of the nonprofits are getting money from various sources and they're restricted. So for all of us to give unrestricted gifts uh, is, is wonderful. And I mentioned on the last slide, there are funds where they're supporting org people individually who are being hurt. The community action programs are an example. So think about ways that we all can give to support um, individuals. And we are still getting gifts into our COVID-19 emergency response fund. So we welcome you partnering with us, continuing to par partner with us. We will continue to look at where the private foundations are making grants, where our donors are making grants, where they may, there may be gaps in funding. Um, so we welcome your partnership there. And before we get to questions, I just want to say either one of us, actually anyone at the Community Foundation is here as a resource for you. So here's our email. And if we don't get to your questions, we, we would be happy to talk with you further. But let me kick it off to you, Sherry, with the first question. How, many of the, how much of the assistance provided by the COVID-19 fund goes for general operating funds of the recipient? 
Sure. So as I said, a lot of uh, the funding that we gave was flexible. So it was up to the recipient on where they use their funding. Um, some used it for operating support, some used it for direct services. Um, but we know from the reporting survey that about 16% of recipients use their awards for organizational overhead, paying the rent and, and otherwise staying in business. About 31% used their funding for staff wages or for stipends for volunteers. Um, so that again would be kind of an overhead organizational cost. And about 18% um, used their funding for COVID protection, cleaning supplies, uh, things so that they could safely reopen. Great. Um, do you want to take first stab? The next question is, how is the pandemic similar to and different from past disasters in Maine? Um, well, what I would say um, is one of the things we have seen about the pandemic is that it's it, it, that uncertainty around no one knows how to proceed. We're all making this up as we go along. We're all doing it in our everyday lives and nonprofits are doing it as they try to respond for clients. So I think that this is what's been a, a big change is that there's no roadmap for where we are right now. Um, and trying to plan for both short and long-term scenarios which out, without knowing which should take precedence has been a real challenge. Um, Laura, yeah. do, you, do you see any other differences? Well, you know, I think back, obviously, 2008, 2009, we had the downturn in the economy and that impacted us as an organization, many of the nonprofits and our donors as well. And there have been natural disasters in Maine, but uh, this is the first time that I know of that the Community Foundation has created an emergency fund like this. So, you know, obviously everyone's saying this is different than anything we've seen in, in our lifetimes. So how does Maine CF response compare to other community foundations in different places? So we are um, keeping in touch with our colleagues and most if not all of the other community foundations have had have COVID-19 funds. They, and many of them are like ours, where the money's coming in and we're getting the money out as fast as possible. I have heard of some community foundations where they have both the money in and out, but they're also saving some of the money for future needs or for some of their stri strategic priorities. And we obviously have a, a separate initiative in those areas and our COVID-19 monies are coming in and out. Gary? Um, so, I, I think we're still waiting to see how community foundations in general have um, handled it because you know we're still in the middle of the work. I think you know it, in a few months we'll have a better sense. I can say that the Center for D Disaster Philanthropy, which has been a great resource during this time, uh, put out a report a month or so ago that showed that worldwide community foundations were responsible for about 49% of the gifts in COVID philanthropy, um, but a much smaller amount of the dollars where corporate foundations gave a bigger dollars, but fewer gifts. So um, I think what we're seeing is that corporate foundations, and by that I mean big ones like Google, uh, were giving huge dollars to some big organizations to help handle um, response, a big, broad nationwide response um, and statewide response, while community foundations were doing what we were doing, which is focusing on our local needs and trying to get dollars out the door to our local organizations that were doing the work on the ground for our specific areas. How about this question? How are different counties, excuse me, affected differently beyond total population and density? What I think we're seeing, um, and we're still learning again, we're, we're still in the middle of it, so we're still learning about the different, how the different regions are being affected. But I think overall what we've seen anecdotally is that Southern Maine certainly has seen more cases. Um, so they are dealing more with um, COVID precautions, with how to isolate and quarantine and help sick people. Um, so that actual the impact of the virus itself is being seen more in Southern Maine. Um, more rural counties have for the most part seen fewer cases, but bigger problems with isolation um, so we've seen greater needs around needing to stay connected, um, connecting students, connecting the uh, older adults, you know, keep just keeping communities sort of engaged with each other in these times when we're sort of isolating. 
And um, certainly some areas are suffering more economically than others. Um, I live on the coast. The tour season was um, it, in some ways better than expected. So right now people are doing okay. That's not the case inland where they, they, they're feeling more economic um, impact. So I think we're still waiting to see from the state actual data on what that means, but that's sort of the anecdotal um, differences that I've seen. Mm -hmm. So the next question, you all probably know that the Community Foundation is working on five strategic goal areas and Sherry is our goal leader for our adult learner goal area. So why don't you take this one, Sherry? How does Maine Community Foundation continue to work on strategic goals and areas of focus during a time of crisis? Um, it's varied by goal. Um, for programs or grants that were already are already underway, we have simply adapted that work. For example, in our early childhood goal area, we had a cohort of communities that had been meeting periodically um, to support each other, to um, come up with strategies to increase um, child care and early childhood uh, quality in their areas. Um, they have continued, but now they're doing that online and their discussions are a lot more focused on how they're supporting their families through COVID. Um, so that is, um, you know, that's one change. Um, in other cases, specific COVID grants have been made in goal areas. Uh, I mentioned the technology grant uh, to adult education and our access to education area and the area agencies on aging for our older adults um, area. Um, in education, we also provided some funding for emergency funds this spring for campuses to help um, them distribute to students who were in crisis to help keep them enrolled through the spring semester. Um, but what we've really seen, I think, overall and across the goal areas is we're seeing a payoff in the years that we have spent building relationships in these areas because um, the relationships were in place. And so we were able to contact our, uh, the folks working in these areas and adapt very quickly um, when, when funding was needed or where we thought there might be funding. Um, so for example, the relationships that we developed during the last few years in our racial equity goal area really uh, meant we were well positioned to react when the racial disparities in COVID cases started to emerge and to be seen. We, we already had those partnerships and relationships in place. So another question is how much of the COVID fund have you spent thus far and next steps in raising further funds? So we just sent out our grants to community action programs around the state to help with the rent relief. So there is only about $50,000 left in our COVID-19 fund. So we are truly spending it out as the money comes in. And next step in raising further funds, you know, as I said at the end, this fund is here for those who wish to contribute. And we're obviously encouraging people to give directly as well, but um, we are having this webinar as information to everybody who has funds and those who don't. And we're also are taping this hopefully um, so we can share it with others and uh, share this information broadly. What kind of dollars are easiest and hardest to raise at this time? So capital campaigns are very difficult. Obviously, it is hard to just meet with somebody in person. So trying to reach out to a new donor. I've heard of capital campaigns around the state uh, that, have, that are in a pause mode, just doing the cultivation of their donors. And uh, some are still continuing and are successful. And endowments are always difficult and especially difficult now as everyone is really focusing on the immediate needs. What opportunity, oh, do you wanna say something, Sherry? Um, I would just say as well, um, you, you discussed um, donors continuing to give to their favorite nonprofits, whether or not they were COVID related. So I would just also reiterate that at this time and saying, if you do have a favorite nonprofit, um, it, even if it's in a land trust or in the arts, that annual fundraising has been a real challenge for people um, right now in this environment. So um, if you're able to offer that, that support, this is a good time to do that. What opportunities has the pandemic created that Maine CF can take advantage of? So it's certainly 
um, the technology, you know, from an operational standpoint, just being able to have a webinar, being able to connect with people this way um, around the state, um, less travel. Sherry, how about from the programmatic standpoint? I think uh, it's a great and tough question. Um, I think what I would love to see continue um, is we've had a real, we've been able to develop real open and honest feedback relationships with our grantees about what they are seeing, what they need, and how we can help. Um, and that's always been our what we try to do. But there's nothing like a crisis to really strip away all of the all of the layers of things and really get to the heart of it. Uh, so I think we would love to see that that continue, just that real honest feedback loop on how we can help, what we're doing that helps, what we're doing that's not helpful, and so we can keep building on the helpful piece. Um, I would love to see that continue. And any use of the State of Maine grants? Um, so that's there's there's a few different areas where the state has been providing funding. Um, certainly, I know that some of our community action programs received rental relief grants um, to help provide rental relief to qualifying Mainers. Um, so that has definitely been helping people. Um, I don't know if you mean the more recent economic recovery grants. Um, that was uh, handled by the Department of Economic and Community Development, um, and they just gave out their phase one round of grants. Um, I think I, I looked this up, hold on, let me find my notes. Um, I looked this up, and so about 10% of the awards went to nonprofits. Um, so at about 10%, and the average grant was around 45,000, but I don't know what that means for the nonprofits as compared to the for-profits. Um, I know that the state of Maine grants, uh, the economic recovery grants, were challenging for some nonprofits and that they required a revenue loss, um, that you show a 20% revenue loss for the year in order to qualify for the grants. And for some nonprofits, they were not showing that loss because they were receiving grant funding from funders like us to do the work that they, that they were doing and to see, solve the increased demand. So they weren't always able to show that revenue loss that they needed to to receive those economic recovery, recovery grants. Um, there, are, there is a second phase of funding happening right now. I think there's still about nine or 10 more days on the, the open application. So um, there may be some changes in the second round. Uh, the, main, uh, the main association of nonprofits is a great place to check on that uh, because they've been tracking that more closely than us. So I was just scanning the chats. I don't see any other questions, but very helpful to see that. And we'll take this input for sure as we're planning future uh, webinars. I did want to say that Don Sierra also pointed out um, in terms of uh, what counties are being impacted, that the closing of the border, the closing of the Canadian border has had a huge impact on the St. John Valley. And thank you, Don, for pointing that out. I imagine that is true for all of our border towns, that they have seen a huge impact um, but because of the closing of the border. So thank you for mentioning that. And I wanted to recognize that. Yeah. And thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you all our county advisors, our grant making um, partners, our donors who have contributed to this fund, who are making grants throughout the state. We will be sharing this webinar for others. So, um, and we really appreciate your feedback and, and any other suggestions, advice, we'd love to hear it. Anything else you wanna say, Sherry? No, just call on us. Uh, please be in touch with any questions and we're, we're happy to uh, help you figure out where to give um, or happy to take suggestions or thoughts about where we should be giving. So thanks very much. And thank you for to all of you who contributed to the COVID-19 fund. It absolutely made a huge difference to a number of nonprofits and we appreciate it. And thanks for spending your lunch hour with us. Bye.